totally fine. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, do you have any any slides at the beginning to introduce the subject? No, no, no. It will be very very informal. I just uh, bring the subject uh, for discussion and uh, uh, hand over to you. And uh, that's where you start, pick up, and uh, continue. So good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to the Smart Learning Program for the Regents. And, uh, and today we have, uh, instead of a theoretical topic, we have got a very practical topic uh, that is on skill learning, and uh, it is basically on uh, laparoscopy. And for today's uh, Smart Learning Program, we have uh, uh, three faculty. And uh, uh, these three faculty have distinguished themselves in the field of uh, advanced laparoscopy and uh, and our masters in the field. And I have great privilege in introducing uh, these faculty to all of you: Dr. Gopal Krishna from Kolkata, Dr. Smith Swain from Kattak, and Dr. Prashant Naik from uh, AIMS Um A um, very warm welcome to our faculty, and a very warm welcome to the uh, residents and other members who have logged in. Um, uh, straight away, I'll just hand over to Gopal. He will uh, uh, initiate the discussion by telling us what he'll be uh, talking about. It is uh, uh, theoretical as well as the mutual dialogue, as well as followed by the question and answers and the doubts which we'll be taking at the end of uh, their presentation. Uh, with this, um, uh, I hand over to Gopal Krishna to take over and start the proceedings. Over to you, Gopal. You need to unmute yourself, Dr. Gopal. Yes. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chavla. And welcome to all the viewers today. I assume most of them are residents. So we will try to make this as useful and interactive as possible. Well, as regarding laparoscopy in urology, uh, today laparoscopy has become as essential as TURP. Um, Whereas one may say that laser prostate is a desirable surgery, similar is robotic surgery, it is desirable. But if we take into account the number of urologists in India doing laparoscopy versus the number doing robotic, we would say that there are almost 25 to 40% of urologists who are actually venturing into laparoscopy either in a basic way or into advanced laparoscopy. Whereas a very small percentage, I would say just about less than five to 10% would actually be doing robotics and that too in the major uh, tier one cities. So therefore laparoscopy is now becoming as essential or as mandatory. Samir, uh, Dr. Samir Swain is going to introduce the subject and tell us how one can venture into safe advanced laparoscopy, because the keywords of this subject of this presentation today is that we must make it as safe as possible so that residents get the confidence to be able to do cases from simple into advanced into more complex cases. Over to you, Samir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you, ESI. Thank you, Dr. Chawla, sir. Uh, my voice is audible. Yes. Yes, Samir. Uh, are you getting my... Uh, slides here? Yeah, we can see here. Okay. You can get into the slide presentation mode. Okay. So without wasting time, I, I must go directly to the points of discussion. Though our viewers are mostly uh, residents, and I think uh, laparoscopy is a very interesting topic. Once you feel it, and once you get into it, probably nobody is there to beat you back. And of course, uh, robotics is a different charm and robotics uh, surgery will be no doubt in a different forum of discussion. But as of now in India, I think laparoscopy is the way to go ahead. 
Uh, coming to the point of learning is never ending process is a non stop orgy of wonderment this pyramid that shows the typical learning pyramid that used we used to have the discussion regarding our teachers training program that uh, that uh, specifically goes in different way like lecture reading audio visual demonstration discussion and practice of doing and teaching others by teaching others we will get into the depth of the knowledge and at least we all must go to the practice by doing at least 75% this much of learning is a must to go for advanced laparoscopy in or it may be in any field so the art of laparoscopy what we should know the basic fundamental is to do the diagnosis of the disease and proper anatomical evaluation beforehand and principle of surgery what is already laid down we must know our own instruments and one must know his limitations not to be over confident to go with the different difficult cases or maybe difficult difficult patient uh, uh, profile like obese patient or patient with comorbidities or patients with a normal or abnormal anatomy in a different anatomical location like pelvic kidney or ectopic kidney or maybe malnutrited kidney those cases should not be done in a uh, initial way and most important point is to avoid stop or surgery that means nobody should be so tight to complete that surgery within that stipulated period of time everybody in initial fail or maybe in advanced steps they must do the surgery in a judicious way and completion of surgery is a point not the time factor and key threshold key point to decide low threshold then to abrace for conversion to open and most important issue is learning should not be at the cost of the patients so how to start and how this is my design how i have started initial exposure in ms and mch period then once i have planned to go with the laparoscopy in neurology specifically i have revisited my general surgery colleague and even my seniors then with lap endotainers then i started basic laparoscopics like nephrectomy orthopexy cis deroping pyeloplasty then gradually switch over to further uh, procedures what initial problem i had initial problem everybody must uh, gone through these uh, these steps like port positioning instruments camera ergonomics time factor and these these are the initial hurdles one must pass so that they will have to go for the advanced laparoscopy once these steps uh, is completed probably the some uh, anybody will get the confidence to do any sort of laparoscopy particularly in neurology so there is a need of refinement for any surgery so one must revisit to go for whatsapp hands on programs recording own videos to see whether some step has been missed what exactly some somebody has done any problem so that in the next step they will have to correct it discussion with mentors and specific point is to update endovision system and energy devices so that the procedure will be easier and most important point is to have a same team particularly the cameraman or the assistant and specific issue has to be taken for the whole team like uh, surgical team with assistants anesthetist everybody should be same so that the steps and uh, refinement of surgery will be better and uh, issue is to be taken as per the case suppose a case is a different one then you have to redefine the steps as per the case and if required the planning has to be done beforehand as per the anatomy as per the ct scan image or whatever the imaging pattern or as per the patient profile so these are the steps open to laparoscopy then to further steps this is one step i have already shown in many areas that is a case of laparoscopy partial nephrectomy patient ultimately bled and we have to go for a radical nephrectomy on table and we have seen the ro mark that is the area of small renal mass but unfortunately the patient had bleeding and uh, there was a uh, difficulty in suturing the uh, deeper layer so probably some sort of major vessel has been missed so that that point has to be taken care in each and every step 
the issue is to revisit your own surgery in case of any difficulties so learning is a continuous process it must for boosting the self confidence and we must know the way ahead burning desire is the fuel and knowing how is the vehicle that we ride so still i am learning and if we stop learning road ahead is blocked and we stop creating history and we will become the history so learning is a learning process it's never ends and we all must learn throughout our life thank you and uh, uh, dr gopal should i start my presentation of basic laparoscopic uh, instruments and all yes yes please i think uh, that would be very useful hello yes i think that will be very useful please go ahead Uh, uh sir uh, we had a plan to go for basic laparoscopic instrument i will not go into detail uh so dr prashant uh, these are the point that you, we all must know in our initial phase i am not going anything in detail just to have a overview how we choose our instrument how one must know the instruments in detail and what are the points we must keep in in mind to procure in one new instrument like purchasing an one instrument these are the uh, specific issues that we usually face in laparoscopy so one by one i am just elaborating endovision system is a must that is the eye of surgeon laparoscopy maybe in Are you playing your we'll, slides? We are yes. still seeing the old old PPT. Can yeah, you have to unmute? Stop this and yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Then me. Uh, yeah. Now you can reshare your new PPT. Okay. Uh, it's okay now. Yes. Now we can see. You can get into the slide presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so, so uh, this is a laparoscopy instrument. these are the yeah. points we almost know the endovision system insubletter and gas trocar hand instruments energy source sealing device specimen retrieval and closure device these these are the basic points we we must know so as a resident and i must tell who are starting the laparoscopy these are the key points we must know and we have to revisit if required whoever he may be maybe a general surgeon maybe gynecologist we must know our details so endovision system is a must that is the eye of surgeon laparoscope of various type it may be rigid or may be flexible as the advancement is now going on these are the endovision unit uh, they, i am nothing to dis nothing i have a disclosure because i am i am having this torch camera i am showing it or else i have no conflict of interest so understanding the basics what is ccd and cmos so these these are the basic points i just want to highlight Uh, the cmos and ccd are the uh, uh, those are the charge coupled device those are the basic uh, camera uh, uh, machinery that that we used to have to get any difficult means i i, I mean to say how we can choose uh, ccd and uh, cmos based uh, technology the cmos based technology is advanced one now almost on cheap and tip technology they are on cmos based so ccd and cmos these are the basic components of camera unit and other components are pixel resolution aspect ratio and scanning these are the points we almost know these are all basic camera or maybe it may be i i mean to say this is a part of photography or maybe physical properties uh, i still i am not uh, thorough in all all the points but all we must all know so what is a pixel pixel is a, pix a short form that shows picture element the smallest bit of data in a video image the smaller the size of pixel the image uh, quality will be better so resolution is the sharpness of the video image uh, it described in the terms of line of resolution it may be vertical or horizontal so aspect ratio is the point we must know how wide is the image is the normal tv it's 4 is to 3 ratio and hd tv and in computer monitor 16 is to 9 and our interest is to go for 16 is to 9 so what is scanning scanning mean interlaces or progressive scan that is the initial image that upper one that i am showing that is interlaced scanning that means you can see the right side image is not clear 
but you see he, the lower part the image is little bit clear that is called progressive scanning that just avoid the motion artifact that means internet scan interlace scanning will have some sort of motion artifact so the clarity of image will be low the how the journey of pb started the st uh, the standard analog system like pal and ntsc then standard definition uh, sdtb and sdtb so sdtb is a point where the aspect ratio and scanning pattern and vertical pixel quality is of this what internationally recognized and in full hd then we can see the standard deviation and high definition image and again this is one image that you can depict the how the image clarity will be changing as per the resolution and other uh, parameters that uh, physical properties will vary so the full hd system and we at least have that is highest special resolution progressive scanning the progressive or interlace that has been depicted 1080p p means progressive scanning i means interlace and the aspect ratio should be 16 is to 9 now you can see the image that we have and now you can see that image this is the 16 is to 9 this is uh, uh, 4 is to uh, 5 is to 4 that uh, normal tv has so sdtb that wide screen broadcast and that should be 16 is to 9 4 is to 3 is not better. So coming to the camera unit, it has head microprocessor unit, three important figure features like horizontal resolution, minimal luminance, signal to noise ratio. The horizontal resolution lines, higher the horizontal lines, better the image. Minimal luminance, that means lux is low. That means image will be better. And noise ratio, signal to noise ratio, if it is higher, the image will be better. So camera system resolution, at least it should have 300 lines so that at least we will get some sort of clarity. So there are various type of imaging units, single chip, three chip unit, high definition, 3D and robotic platform. Single chip, uh, most of us now almost uh, not uh, having in many companies are almost uh, not marketing also, but this is the monitor resolution at least for 400 to 600 lines. Three chip camera, that means three chip means the red, green, and blue is represented. And the re resolution is around 950 lines. And SD camera, the resolution is around 1080 at least. And full SD with two, mil two, two million pixel. So these are the various physical properties we almost know when we are procuring a camera unit because many company people may not tell in detail. So uh, one must uh, go through this. And what are the outputs that we have in video camera? These are the types, but RGB, composite, and digital. These are the three mainly used now. Composite is almost uh, not good. And as of now, in a high definition system, DVI, that means digital video interface, or HDMI, high definition media inter interface. These are the two units that used to uh, in a uh, clinical application, and we are interested to. So binocular image uh, has to be maintained. For SD monitor, 1080 oblique 1920, that has to be basic form. And uh, this is another form of fluorescent imaging system that if some camera in it have, it is better. That will be useful in a specific clinical situation. Coming to the light source, halogen, metal oxide, and xenon, and LED. Nowadays, LED is almost accepted in many areas. Uh, Genon is also used in some ways, but halogen and others are almost not in clinical use. And light cable is, they work in a principle of conducted through a curved glass mechanism. It may be of fiber optic cable or fluid field cable. The uh, probably some company is using fiber optic fluid field cable. The image uh, that light transmission is also almost equal in uh, both form. One must know one important clinical aspect, the tip of the light source. Tip of the light source, the temperature is at least uh, two, it may be maximum up to 268 centigrade. That means this temperature, it may be transmitted to the telescope tip. It may not be same or it may be low as comparison to that. So we must take care during handling of the scope, the tip should not be touched to any of the internal organ continuously for uh, maybe more to uh, four to six seconds or may not be more than 10 seconds. They may have some thermal effect. 
So coming to the monitor, again, the uh, resolution uh, pixel, these are to be considered. An input cable to the monitor, composite or S-video, RGB, DVI input or HDMI input. Because once we have a camera unit, the in output of the camera in unit and the input of the monitor has to be in the highest part in order to get the better image. So medical grade monitor, USA that is NTSC system and European that is PAL system and CCAM is French system. <clears throat> so almost all uh, we are using NTSC or PAL because uh, as for the company device, uh, um, we, we can have this, uh, these are of basic uh, knowledge. And most important issue is to know as per the sales and service and standby if available or not. Video documentation and editing, one must know as a uh, one surgeon has to, uh, to be well trained or at least some uh, computer assistant, computer uh, guy should be there to assist you. Uh, so these are the recording methods like pen drive almost nowadays inbuilt pen drive or uh, as a separate tool, uh, all the companies are having this. Ideal video format, maybe window media video, ABI, most, uh, MPG or MP4. Now almost, uh, almost Blu-ray and other newer uh, modalities are available. We can go to any newer method, probably the image clarity will be better. These are few editing software that, that we almost know, Adobe Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro, Movie Maker or Pinnacle. These are the uh, uh, basic software that each all of us must have a some sort of overview or uh, gross knowledge so that we can manipulate in case of requirement. Coming to the insufflator and gas, probably Dr. Gopal will uh, take some, uh, uh, will have some discussion during other uh, session from Dr. Gopal. Uh, energy sources again, this is the uh, basic component of a, a light or electric current. Now you seen from the left that is 60 hertz and the last it is more. But in electrocautery, it is around 200 kilohertz to 3.3 megahertz. So at this area, the usually you don't get the current as in household application of less hertz. So these are the areas where we used to have a surgical application. And this is the typical description how pure cut blend, blend two and blend three and coagulation is described. I am not going into detail, but we almost know in the, uh, the basics parameters should be known to us. So this is the difference between electrocautery and electrosurgery. The image that shows the electrocautery is the direct sharing effect and electrosurgery, there will be a circuit that has to be completed. Uh, coming to there is a manipular equipment like forceps, seizure or J-hook. Uh, there it produces more smoke. Insulation failure has to be taken care of. Direct coupling to the other instrument, metal instrument should be avoided. Continuous use more for a more period that more than six sessions should be avoided. And uh, these are the steps we must know uh, before setting any a monopolar or bipolar instruments. Uh, these are a little bit clumsy, but I, I must over uh, uh, pass through. Coming to the bipolar instruments, now uh, bipolar dissector and bipolar other instruments are available. Dr. Gopal will complete some, uh, some of them. Coming to the sealing device, uh, these are basic vessel sealing devices. It may be a bipolar radio frequency generator and at least it will seal seven millimeter diameter or more. So uh, uh, now there is a harmonic scalpel just like ultrasonic scissor. So this uh, usually frequency at least 50, uh, 55,000 hertz the generator, handpiece and blade. These are the basic points we almost know. So it will pay, uh, produce less smoke, low temperature, but thermal effect is, and lateral thermal spread is also important. This table is a very common table. All, uh, uh, all the resident must know this table in detail so that what are the points and what are the techniques we uh, choose uh, in a definitive, definitive uh, situation. So uh, clips in laparoscopy that are metal clips or hemolo clips, uh, they, they, we almost know the basic points. And uh, there are uh, other instruments like vascular endostoplers, these are also be used. Other energy sources like lasers uh, and CO2 argon, APC and uh, CUSA and hydrojet, 
these are just a sake of completion. Hemostatic uh, uh, agents like fibrosil and fluorosil, this can be used in specific situation. Coming to the maintenance, light cable, light source, telescope, we must know as a individual sterilization of the devices. And uh, these are the point uh, probably you almost know. So as a resident, we almost go through all points uh, so that uh, uh, basic laparoscopy one will start, cleaning, handling, sterilization process, and uh, 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 st uh, safe keeping is related to each and every manufacturer. We must follow their instruction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir. I think we had a very detailed discussion on the type of instruments that we need to use and the advantages of uh, One important thing that comes to mind, uh, Dr. Samir spoke about the light cable and the temperature that it generates. It is important to understand that the 4mm telescope that is used for endourology is different from the 10mm telescope that across. So when we use 4mm telescope or 5mm telescope, one should not increase the light intensity to 100% because that will generate more heat and that can damage your lens. So in such cases, it is advised by the manufacturers not to increase the light intensity to more than 40 to 50%. The reason is because we often have a tendency, we ask the OT technicians to increase the light to 100% and that is, will damage our instrument in the long run. Now, uh, coming to the other, topics that we have uh, now. I will go to my presentation. So the we are all making a journey into safe advanced laparoscopic urology and the key word here is always to be safe. Um, I told you that laparoscopy was as common as TURP and therefore it's all not only essential but it has become mandatory. Uh, something that one can choose uh, as a desirable surgery. And as I said, the number of urologists doing laparoscopic surgery is gradually increasing. I would estimate it to be almost 50% of all urologists who are now exiting and getting into uh, private practice. Now, with this, Samir uh, spoke about the various choice of dissectors that we can use. So here I have presented four different types of dissectors that we all use. On the top is a, mon is a scissors with monopolar attachment. Then is a monopolar hook. You, then you have a bipolar dissection, many of us tend to use. And lastly is the harmonic scalpel. Now amongst these three, the, the, these four, the harmonic scalpel is exclusive because it is expensive. Whereas the other three uh, can be reused and therefore are cheaper. Therefore, a lot of urologists tend to use them, especially those in solo private practice. But of course, they have certain advantages and disadvantages and certain dangers as well. So uh, Dr. Prashant, would you like to tell me what are the advantages of the monopolar hook and the scissors? Uh, okay. Or would you so, recommend them? Mm -hmm. And is there a safe dissector or a beginner's dissector which, uh, which you would advise? Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. GK, thanks for having me here and thanks for this opportunity. So let me be very practical about it. As you brought economics also into the mix. So the monopolar hook is probably one of the most used, one of the most versatile and is a very safe sector if used properly. As Samir has already pointed out, we need to be aware that the spread of monopolar energy is slightly more complex than bipolar and then when you compare it under beat or one of those new modern ones like harmonic and all that so since that is slightly higher so yeah hello so yeah yes like, yes go on please uh, hello hello am i audible yeah yes yeah yes, so, go on please so what I meant to say is that, so this monopolar hook is probably something that can be used in these cases without much difficulty. But if you ask me what is safe, 
then one of this advanced ones like the harmonic ones or the thunderbeat ones these are probably safer and the build of the new thunderbeat and the new harmonic devices are such that it allows for a small angulation or a small curve that makes dissection also easy right having said that i also there is a role for this right angle forceps also if you have to dissect around the hilum so i think around the hilum samir will agree with me and you also that we need to have a mix of all this instruments including a good harmonic or a thunderbeat with a hook to take out all the tissues and to go around we need something like a right angle also so it's a mix of all three but hook is a very versatile if you want it economical otherwise if you have no constraint of economics you should have one of this advanced bipolar or ultrasonic dissectors with you yeah. uh, samir uh, when you started your practice in laparoscopy at that time probably the harmonic was not available so out of the top 3 uh, uh, what was it that you used hello yes sir yes. can hear you uh, uh, harmonic actually it was available but initially i don't have it <laughs> because of financial yes. part but some other in uh, uh, hook and monopola uh, maybe with the scissor or maybe with spatula i have uh, initially started but within few days i i feel there is a definitive role of getting into some advanced energy system uh, because you see suppose we are having a good endovision system or energy energy device the surgical steps are very easy we just avoid bleeding the field is clear ultimately surgery completes early we don't lose your confidence ultimately patient's benefit is of uh, priority so i feel uh, hook monopolar is definitely has a role hook is a versatile one but uh, advanced energy sources has to be there on table and as the situation demands the instruments has to be changed that is yeah. the okay. key point i must tell as the situation yeah. demands the instrument yeah. should be changed i totally agree yes, on this point if you have if you use an advanced energy source there are a lot of limitations like for example yeah. thunderbeat you know would last you for four five cases a harmonic new hd 1000 has been activation time is is only only about five hours that is not even activation time five hours of switching it on right so that is the reset point so what you need to do is so we need to get around this curves so do your entire thing with a monopolar hook or a monopolar scissor switch on the machine suppose company wants then switch on hd 1000 only when you need it you think you need it near the hilum you use it at that moment and you economize so similarly underbeat keep it reserved for a difficult part of the of the dissection that is other point second is i find in certain cases like a monopolar scissor works beautifully if you want to do a lap radical prostatectomy i have done the entire lrp using a monopolar scissors only so you don't need anything else also I mean other than that and then you need some you know, it's wet clips and hemolo clips and all that okay? so it depends upon the case and also you need to economize and where to use the advanced instruments yes okay yes, so the, the 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 so the so the message to the residents is that out of the four instruments that you have the the uh, monopolar instruments are cheaper but yes. uh, so therefore get used to using the monopolar instruments keep the harmonic scalpel or the uh, thunderbeat in reserve because there will be some situations especially when you are going through uh, fatty tissue where the monopolar instruments tend uh, not to cut and and the other thing that they generate a lot of smoke especially when you are trying to cut through thick tissue or fatty tissue uh, so that's where the harmonic scalpel has an advantage because it generates steam and that doesn't disturb the vision number 1 and number 2 is that it cuts through fatty tissue or thick tissue much faster however one needs to remember that the harmonic scalpel tends to give a sense of false confidence sometimes when you want to just run through tissues very rapidly therefore it would be advisable to uh, dissect the tissues initially get to know about the safe landmarks with the monopolar instruments before you actually graduate into harmonic scalpel the last thing is that 
when we use monopolar instruments, try to use a plastic port so that the diathermy effect is not transmitted through the port. Yes, Prashant, you wanted to say something. So uh, I just wanted to add something more. Uh, if you have an advanced energy source, you should have. Because when I do use for a lab radical hysterectomy, you can do it entirely using a thunderbeat or one of this uh, this thing. You do not need to clip like it, anything. Entire, all the lateral vascular attachment, everything can be taken down using one of these advanced vessel sealers. So there is a role for each and every instrument. Other point is when you're using this advanced vessel sealers, you should wait for the seal cycle to complete. So we had, uh, my, my, from my personal experience, I have seen some surgeons who are in a bit of a hurry. They just apply and it does one, two times and then they cut it. You know, that at that moment, it looks everything is hunky-dory, everything is sealed. But we have seen in those surgeons who are in a hurry and who do not wait for the seal cycle to complete before cutting it, the ooze is more, the post-operative yes, right. discharge is more, the lymphodia is more. So I think if you're using them, use it as they should be. So that is another point. Yes, okay. that's right. Now, coming to the next thing, the number of ports that one uses for laparoscopic surgery, this has always been a big question amongst the uh, novices or the residents. Uh, where sh should you, not just the placement of the ports, but how many ports should you put? Uh, should you put uh, three ports for an nephrectomy or should you put four or should you put five? Uh, wh what decides the number of ports that you place? Uh, can I ask Samir? Yes. Uh, I think uh, number of port is not important. Issue is that how easy is your surgery? Exactly. What is the location? Yes. And how with minimum number of ports you can complete the surgery. But there should not be fixed mind that I will complete within three ports, I will complete within four ports. No. If required or if the situation demands, we can change over to more one. Number of port is not the question at all. And uh, in initial phase, uh, there is a, a typical inhibition to make more number of ports. Even I do have that uh, sense initially because I was thinking, suppose I will put, uh, I will create number of uh, ports more probably somebody will tell what happened, you have done five, six ports. But as the time goes, I feel, I ultimately realize that number of ports is not important. I feel yes, it's yes. not at all a point. Exactly. So the message to the residents is, number one, place the ports yourself. Whoever is going to do the surgery should place the ports because the position of the ports depends upon your height and the configuration, your relation to the patient. That's number one. Secondly, uh, as Dr. Samir said, that do not be hesitant to place additional ports if you feel that the original placed ports are not comfortable for you. Uh, these are only 5 mm ports and therefore they do not uh, create any sort of weakness in the abdomen and certainly they create a very tiny scar. At the end of the day, it is better to have a successful laparoscopic surgery with even 6 ports rather than to have an open surgery with a long scar. So uh, do not be hesitant to place ports wherever and whenever comfortable or you want to revise them, please go ahead. Now, the next question, uh, this is to uh, Dr. Prashant. Now, I have shown you three different types of needle holders. The top is Olympus, then in the middle you have an Escolab self-writing needle holder, and then the lastly you have a pistol-shaped one. Uh, what is your take on the on the type of needle holder or what you use? You know, this uh, is an eternal confusion amongst residents yeah. and yeah. young yeah. surgeons. Yes, I would say to each his own, right? Because yes. Carl Stoes, I have used Ulf, I have used, so we are okay with it. I was okay with it. The point about the self writing one, self writing helps at least helped me in my initial days when I started doing reconstructed. So self-writing is easy. You hold it anytime. It writes itself and, and fixes in the correct angle, anatomical 90 degree angle. But later on, you need the other needle. Also, you cannot do everything with a self-writing needle because sometimes you have to change that angle. If it is only 90 degrees, you cannot do everything with that. So you need to have little bit variation in those angles. So to each is one. I think I there is nothing much to choose. Even I was I did not want one with a ratchet. So many times I use it without a ratchet. I just hold it and I go through the tissues 
and uh, uh, yeah so that also helps so it's up to you how you go about it but Any, self writing can, can help in the beginning but later you have to let go of that also yeah. okay any yes. difference between the pistol handle versus the straight handle no i i did not find uh, any difference basically i am okay. not using I mean, this handle yeah samir what about you yeah, yeah actually I, i just want to highlight one point now you see uh, for pelvic surgery particularly like doing a lap radical prostate and uh, maybe low down vvf the angle of needle to the needle holder is may not be 90 degree so that is one of the uh, maybe negative point for self writing one otherwise in other situation self writing is fantastic uh, only few situation probably we need to change the angle particularly taking the dvc and regarding pistol shaped ratchet or straight i think all is individualized whoever is doing if somebody is comfortable with doing in any form of instrument i think it's okay uh, i so, i think the so. design has got nothing to do with techniques is the individual uh, surgeon's preference okay yeah so 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 we all know that uh, suturing is an integral part of laparoscopic urology unlike other uh, branches of uh, on, of laparoscopic surgery so as both the experts have said that you must have your own needle holder if you desire to do laparoscopic uh, suturing have your own needle holder and practice with that own needle holder so that you know exactly what angle you are going to hold it and how you are going to tackle it within the abdomen so do not so so you so this is one of the basic armamentarium which you need to invest and buy uh, if you want to progress do not use any needle holder that is given to you because this will increase your time yes prashant no i exactly agree with you i just wanted the needle holder becomes an extension of your hand eventually so you should exactly. carry it with you. so that is necessary because if you go to a new place and a new needle holder is given you may not be able to do it well because it takes That's some it, it takes some time to get used to it correct exactly and between the pistol and the straight handle again there is no uh, real difference uh, but in general i think most of us have uh, moved on to using straight handle instruments uh, the pistol used to be used before regarding the self writing i personally use it because i find it very easy especially during laparoscopic partial nephrectomy because i can hold the needle quicker and 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 then complete the suturing faster but in other situations like ligation of the dvc or in vvf you may have to hold the needle at various angles where the other needle holder may be useful so therefore uh, it is useful to invest in at least one or two needle holders so that uh, and and keep them to yourself and keep practicing on the endo trainer with the same set of needle holders now coming to the uh, insufflator now is this as you can see at the end of it you can see on the right side it says 20 which is actually this is actually a 20 liter uh, insufflator we also know that we have a high flow insufflator called, which is 40 or 45 liters now uh, prashant can you tell me where would one the high flow insufflator help you or where would, now obviously all these comes at a higher cost so where does the high flow insufflator help you and is it mandatory i think yes this is uh, 20 is only good for lap appendectomy lap cholecystectomy if you come to any urological surgery where you are doing any urological laparoscopy i consider it personally that any urology lab including nephrectomy is an advanced lab you need a high flow also because all the smoke that is generated needs to be evacuated the moment uh, in a 20 if you evacuated the whole abdomen collapses so it will yes. not refill you need a 40 if you want to have a smooth easy laparoscopy mane you okay. need to have a high flow. yes high well flow. samir i know that you are into private practice the 20 liter call, uh, insufflator costs about 4 lakhs whereas the 45 liters costs about 7 and 1/2 lakhs so uh, what do you do uh, uh, no actually uh, for advanced laparoscopy i think high flow is a uh, preferable one absolutely but, uh, but uh, specifically a uh, high flow i think is not that much important like suppose we are having heated uh, a system like uh, uh, i think the company uh, having olympus has got integrated heating system not not, not yeah, olympus yeah. i think uh, even olympus has got it. striker yeah striker yeah. is having some heated oxy, uh, co2 
in that smoke uh, is quite less stores people is having some smoke detector and they evacuate the aut automatical evacuation system yes. so these are much more useful than to get into the high flow but high flow is definitely one advantage but we must look into the uh, physiological or physiological effect of co2 and when there is a rapid change in intraabdominal pressure and high flow with high pneumo is is not safe as comparison to high pneumo with low flow or low pneumo with medium flow so yes. these are the points you must uh, consider when choosing the uh, other specifications like uh, insulator yes. device and uh, pneumo uh, in it's surgeries that gen that yeah, i found that in surgeries that generate a lot of uh, smoke especially in pelvic surgery the high flow insufflator is very very useful where a lot of really suctioning really. suctioning is being done whereas for situations like say a uh, nephrectomy uh, where the surgery doesn't take very long where there is not much uh, dissection or not much smoke generation there i think you can manage with a 20 liter insufflator so therefore if one is desiring to do advanced laparoscopy i think a high flow insufflator with uh, with warmer is an essential uh, requisite and i think the high flow insufflators do have an inbuilt warmer yes samir uh, rather prashant did you have want to add no. something yeah i just wanted to say that uh, what samir wrote in point that uh, no high flow insufflators are not unsafe it's only unsafe if you raise the pneumo so if you keep the pneumo at a desired level at, at a safe level then the machine is going to modulate how much flow of, uh, of air it is giving yes. so there is not and i think all high flows do not have integrated heating only a few of them like few samir mentioned Riker has and now i think olympus has it here so not everything so so next oh, week is, now there is, are is that is there is that we must know the physiological property of pneumo and high flow and vishab is the clinical situation like pediatric case obese patients or patients with comorbidities all these funds has to be considered uh, along with this uh, instrument yes. and and other point is even in a high flow there is a setting for low flow you can yes. go to so a, that's not a, a problem high so flow has a definitive advantage yeah. so these are the these are something like the high power lasers where you can even yes. use it as a, as a lower setting so i yes, think is yes, especially yes. if you one is doing a lot of pelvic surgery you definitely need a high flow insufflator because there is continuous suctioning and then so that the vision is not disturbed now coming down there are two basic types of scissors that we all see one is a straight scissors one is a curved scissors where exactly would you use a straight scissors say suppose you have applied a hemolock clip uh, on the renal vein or the renal artery and then you are going to cut the renal artery or the renal vein uh, do where what what scissors would you use a straight or a curved scissors is there anything specific any any message to the residents uh samir you want to go on this no, or no, okay so uh, you you can use a straight scissor to if you want to have a clean straight cut so i find a straight scissor sometimes useful if we are doing a pyeloplasty you yes, want to make a straight cut that somehow yes. straight if you can get it in a correct angle that helps yes. Yes. otherwise uh, the hemolock uh, when you are cutting a tissue above a hemolock you can use either a straight or a uh, curved scissor as long as you follow principles that you have to leave one or two millimeter of tissue beyond the hemolock you cannot cut right on the hemolock so i think both are okay uh straight scissors also we used to cut threads and all that by convention we use we try to preserve the curve scissors for longer because we also use it in lap radical prostatectomy and all that yes. so we use it for tissue dissection yeah, yeah i think that tissue is very important do not mix the same scissors for tissue cutting as well as for suture cutting uh, otherwise you will be harming the instrument exactly now now you have a 12 mm port uh, as well as a 10 mm port uh, any advantages of a 12 mm port over a 10 mm port because a, a 10 mm port may appear uh, to be enough to introduce a laparoscope to introduce a gauze piece or other things or to introduce instruments most of our instruments are less than 10 mm but where exactly would you use a 12 mm port is there any basic advantage of a 12 mm port samir uh Only specific situation that's okay. Many times clinically, 10 mm port is okay. 
sometimes uh, 12mm port like using some specific instrument maybe uh, uh, like a certain ski or, or, or a bulldog or a bull or a bulldog bulldog certain ski yeah. the bulldog certain ski may be commonly it can easily be used with 10mm also but 12mm yeah. will be easier but specifically when you are using extra large clip if required then that is one of the advantages uh, because the, that applicator is may not be sufficient for 10mm port yeah. the other advantage i found that the valve of these 12mm ports uh, allows allows gauze pieces to be introduced easily in in as well as to be taken out whereas yes. with the 10mm port the gauze often gets stuck so i tend to use uh, one 12mm port Uh, to introduce gauze pieces or to take out some tissues for example you have done a lymph nodal dissection and you can take out the entire lymph nodal packet very cleanly without breaking the lymph node uh, through these 12 mm ports yes prashant so, you know so i had another issue with this 10 mm versus 12 mm was what samir said when i used to put a hemolock inside sometimes when you put 10 mm many times i lost the hemolock because trying to get that extra 1 mm less sometimes i have locked the hemolock so yeah yes. so that has happened so i think so, 12 mm is really better if you so i think one one 12 mm is very useful for these things but to put in clips and to take out tissue pieces or to introduce yes. gauze pieces take out gauze pieces um yeah. and these covidian ports are very very uh, nice now yes, now this is something that i think samir spoke about earlier now uh, we generally tend to use nitrous oxide anesthesia in most of our ors of course in some ors they do have dedicated air anesthesia machines and the way to identify them is the, on the left side the ash color or the gray color is a is a air cylinder whereas the blue color is a nitrous cylinder similarly if you look at the back of your anesthesia apparatus you will see there are separate uh, and air vents one for air which is black and white the nitrous is for blue and the oxygen is for white so what are the differences between using air anesthesia versus standard nitrous oxide anesthesia uh, any of you can take that question yes can i take that yes yeah uh, why i am interested to take this question actually <clears throat> i used to have a hustle with uh, my anesthetist many times even in uh, many situation i ultimately told them to you uh, stop uh, nitrous actually there was a um, uh, risk of um, distension of intestines mainly uh, yeah. small intestines when nitrous is to be used for a more longer period and it may not be more use more difficult for general surgeon because their position of operating is different but many times in neurologist we are having lat lateral uh, positioning where the if patient is obese but the intestine used to fall or it may move up and once it is distended probably the surgery will be difficult so uh, nitrous uh, you um, air anesthesia is no doubt very much useful or maybe favorable or preferable if at all possible nitrous is not to be used in uh, laparoscopy where at least the duration of surgery is expected to be around 1 hour or more yes that's that's right so for prolonged surgery especially in most laparoscopic urology is a prolonged surgery and if you are doing if you are doing pelvic surgery or you, where the bowels can come in the way i think you should you be asking your anesthetist or the or department to be using air anesthesia rather than nitrous nitrous is identified by blue and air is an air is an identified by an ash color uh, prashant anything before i move yeah, on no, so I, i agree with that for longer one use use air and for shorter one you can get away with the nitrous yes. no okay now for a novice surgeon or a beginner a laparoscopic urologist between ablative lap and reconstructive lap um this is a video of a surgeon doing a laparoscopic renal cyst marsupialization do you think this is a good good surgery for a beginner to try his hands and why i actually yes i think uh, a marsupialization um in a a good exophytic marsupialization should be something that you can start with uh, having said that extirpative surgeries are not always easy you can get stuck in a badly stuck simple nephrectomy also so uh, yeah you should but you know reconstruction needs a little bit of more skill even when i teach my residents first they learn 
how to do a nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy. And then probably even I have residents going on to radical cystectomy, but they have not done a laparoscopic hyaloplasty because hyaloplasty, I believe they need more skills. So, yeah, so uh, I would so the, so give this them is extra. A, yeah. So this is a, so renal cyst surgery is probably one of the surgeries that all of us have done uh, as a beginner because number one the cyst is easily visible as soon as you enter into the abdomen it is protruding through the perinephric fat secondly you don't have to go to the vessels uh, and therefore uh, and removing the cyst basically is marsupialization is very very easy the only catch is that if there are multiple cysts then one needs to be careful. Uh, as we all do, we put in a retrograde catheter to make sure that none of those cysts are communicating. So, uh, so solitary cysts are easy surgeries to start for a beginner. Now, this is a central tumor in a patient. Uh, Samir, would you hand this to your third year resident or your second year resident to do an nephrectomy? Samir? Hello, uh, I, 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 I can get that question actually. Well, th this is a, a central tumor and obviously yeah. uh, a, a partial nephrectomy seems to be almost impossible here. So is this a good case to be given to your third year resident or your second year resident and why? No, no de definitely no, uh, may not be because this is a uh, central tumor means the procedure will be no doubt difficult. No. No, this yeah, will no. be obviously. No similar issue will be the location, locating the tumor. No, no what I said was, uh, let me reframe my question. So this yeah. is a central tumor and it is a diffuse tumor. So uh, obviously the plan is to do a, la a radical nephrectomy in this case. So, okay. uh, so is this a good case to be given to your uh, resident to do under supervision? Actually, uh, no, actually I was thinking of getting into a partial nephrotomy. No, no, for, no, no, no. For radical nephrectomy, probably this is the best case for resident training. Yes, so this because looks a normal. Probably case. the uh, uh, tissue around kidney will be a normal one. Second issue is getting into the plane, getting into the hilum will not be a problem. Third issue is uh, tumor spillage or any other uh, problem during exophytic tumor is not a question here. So yes. I think for initial training, it's a fantastic case. And it's, so to say, this is a normal nephrectomy or it may be just like a donor nephrectomy uh, where the plane yeah. and everything anatomically, it's normal. Okay. So, but so, partial, I was thinking it's a really difficult case. No, no, no. Case. no. So, 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 the next question, so, so the next question to you, Prashant, suppose yeah. your resident has done uh, 10 such nephrectomies. Okay. Suppose yeah. your resident has done 10 such nephrectomies of uh, of this type uh, can he attempt a lab donor nephrectomy because <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is that is also a, a normal kidney isn't it so, you know so what, what is uh, the, for my take is the stakes with lab nephrectomy and lab donor are way higher so i wouldn't give somebody who has done 10 somebody who is a resident immediately after that so maybe my threshold to give uh, a lab donor would be much higher than doing 10 such nephrectomies. So, so therefore, a donor nephrectomy is a completely different uh, uh, sort of no, uh, thought process. Uh, but yes, my, my, can I can I? Yes, actually, it's not the question of uh, who is doing. Actually, getting number of case and learning curve. These are all individualized. Actually, many a times yes. in any center, any WhatsApp or any of the uh, conferences, everybody tells about the learning curve. Learning curve is absolutely, it's not a very straightforward job. It's a very individualized job. So I think 10 case or 20 case is not important. The person doing, he may be resident, may be a consultant with few experience or maybe uh, with good experience, but at least the approach to the case, case selection and the steps, if he is doing perfectly, I don't feel any difficulties to get into a donor nephrectomy will be a difficult. I just have a contrary opinion to uh, Prashant. Probably I feel donor nephrectomy is safe. But here the issue is the error window is very less. The chance of uh, uh, any sort of complication is not accepted. That is the issue. Here it depends on the person who is doing that surgery, how keen and how to the principal he is doing the surgery. Number of case, I don't feel it is of great help 
particularly choosing in case of donor nephrectomy okay because so therefore because the, uh, so, so so therefore between the two of you as you say that uh, if at all you are going to allow him to do a donor nephrectomy you would supervise him more closely Yes, absolutely. Uh, That's the issue. Um, rather than on, on, uh, on a, a very close because donor nephrectomy uh, is, I think, it is the easiest nephrectomy with high cusp. So therefore, easiest for a for a for a for a new consultant or a new MCH or a DNB uh, sort of uh, re, not a resident but somebody who has just completed his MCH, he if he at all does a lap donor nephrectomy after doing such simple nephrectomies, he should always keep a senior. Uh, laparoscopic behind him to supervise him rather than doing it completely unsupervised. Yes, Prashant? No, I also want to stress this point that, okay, fine, I agree with Samir that as long as he's good, he can go. He should also understand that the difference between a donor, ne donor nephrectomy and a radical nephrectomy. Donor nephrectomy, there are lots of other things. You need to get length, you need to tackle the number where you need to yeah. get a good length and you need to prevent the stretch on the arteries, you need to prevent energy source near the vessel. So there are, there are a lot of other things. As long as oh. he is competent and he understands all the issues, Principles then it is okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Principles. Okay. Okay. And is, is, is should should he be have should he have done a few open donor nephrectomies before attempting lab donor nephrectomy? Is there such a requirement? I don't think that is true anymore. I don't think that is true okay. anymore. Yes. Okay. Now the, now next, then I then Prashant, you please take this question. This is again something that you have seen before. This is a, a, a moderate-sized lower pole tumor, and a lap partial is is almost impossible for a novice. But a lap radical nephrectomy is very easy for him uh, because the pedicle looks clean uh, and he can go through the pedicle very easily. Once having ligated the pedicle, the rest of the surgery is very easy. So, what would you uh, sort of what should if you were a new surgeon or somebody who is relatively inexperienced for partial what 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 would be your thought process in this case so my first would you know, advice, yes. do not compromise on what is best for the patient just because you want to do a laparoscopic case this patient is a candidate for partial nephrectomy if you can do it laparoscopy well and good, otherwise convert and do an open partial nephrectomy for this patient. Do not do a lap radical nephrectomy in this patient. This has to be done. You can start with lap. You can mobilize, proceed as far as you can. But if you uh, get stuck up, do not hesitate to open and do an open partial nephrectomy in this patient. Yeah. Yes. So the message to all uh, new entrants into laparoscopy is do not sacrifice the patient for your own learning. Do what is best for the patient. So, if it's a renal cyst, if it's a single large cyst, it's easy to do. For a multiple cyst, be a bit careful. Radical nephrectomy, as we said, small tumors, T1 tumors, go ahead and do it for uh, for, no, for new surgeons. Um, for T2 tumors, do not attempt that at the beginning. Keep a mentor behind you or you attempt it on your own after you have done a good number of uh, T1 tumors. And lastly, do not perform a radical nephrectomy where partial nephrectomy is the norm for that particular patient. Now, again, would any of you like to take it? What is it? Is transperitoneal easier than retroperitoneal for a beginner? Or is uh, retroperitoneal easier? Depends on where you're trained and what you're trained on. But most of the students would have learned on transperitoneal. They have been exposed to transperitoneal uh, laparoscopy. I think for them, transperitoneal would be easier, except for a DNB student who has passed out from IKDRC or a center which is a high volume retroperitoneal or a retroperitoneal would be easier. Yeah. So okay. I think most of us have, <clears throat> during our MS days, we have done lap cholecystectomy and lap appendix and assisted in lap colonic surgeries or other bowel surgeries. So I think we are more familiar with the uh, transperitoneal route. So I think that is probably the way to go, especially for a beginner. Uh, as regarding retroperitoneal, if you have seen a lot of cases, then maybe you may do. You must remember that often in retroperitoneum, the window is small. If there are adhesions, then it is difficult to get into planes and therefore you cannot move about from one place to the other. So transperitoneal seems to be easier for a beginner. So 
this is something that we have discussed to some extent uh, how much importance would you give to uh, live workshops or attending live workshops or online videos youtube videos are there any disadvantages of these two does it make you more overconfident or does it give you confidence samir you want to go or let me okay yeah, actually, so actually so so is a mentor is definitely one big advantage initial phase one must have a mentor behind you second is when you go advanced live workshop will be of much help online videos are very easy to get it very easy to see very interesting to see also and it looks lucrative but be uh, we must be very much uh, uh, me you should not be very confident or over confident what you have already told online videos they are almost edited edited one if you go through the unedited videos if available then it is better uh, edited videos that you usually have on many conferences or like uh, uh, online videos what what are available uh, I, i i i am not very happy with uh, uh, yes that, uh, Steps. i think all of us all of us have seen helpful. that yes yeah. but of course it will be helpful when we are going for a different different or new case just to know the steps what are the uh, important steps or what are the important points you need yes. to know exactly that is the so, point so i think an online video is useful to fine tune or to uh, learn one or two key points over what you already know but it is not good to learn from the basics online videos because all of them are edited and all of us like to present our best picture on online videos live workshops are useful all of us have gone through live workshops because there you see the surgeon sometimes doing well sometimes he is struggling so you see everything you also see how he has moved from the beginning to the end of the case so i think uh, that is also useful actually the human and tendency is to so of the Uh, good things nobody shows the yes. compl- complications or anything yes. nobody yes. Uh, can you have can, can somebody have any experience of getting difficult or complicated videos on any person who is doing laparoscopy or who, who is having large number of videos online i, I feel it may not it may be less than 1% it of people exactly yes, that's yes, the issue Prashant. yeah so i so, i i i totally agree with your points on online videos the advantage of live workshop over online the advantage of unedited mentor is also very important i somehow feel absolutely if you go to a mentor you not only see what's happening inside the abdomen i whenever i see somebody live operating in ot i see what their hands are doing outside how they hold the instrument how they move around so you don't see those things plus the all the pre operative prep that goes into it all the post op management the insu protocol so those are also important i can guarantee you you that you find you make a list of mentors this is for all the newers all the new kids on the block you make a list of the mentors write email saying sir i want to come to your center i will pay for my hotel stay and my travel and everything can i watch you for one week or 10 days i i don't think there are a lot of people who will say no to that so you should yeah is right so so i think uh, the message is all of us should not be hesitant in in asking a mentor feel free to there are many surgeons doing laparoscopic urology find your local mentor go and spend time with him and all of them are most welcoming and they will teach you how they do a particular surgery and you can see them from beginning to end and you can also see pre surgery and post surgery so that is also very important you don't want to be a technician you want to be a, a surgeon at the end of the day uh, live workshops are also useful now now this is as you can see a, a large stone in the renal pelvis uh, suitable for a sort of pyelolithotomy or a lap pyelolithotomy is this a good case for a beginner and uh, or a, for a new surgeon and why i mean is this an ent- is this a way forward to learning pyeloplasty uh i feel no uh, you know uh, i whenever you have such a large stone i i see this looks easier on a ct scan but you go in you find dense adhesions there everything would be plastered there will be pyelonephritic changes and everything so yeah you can try but i don't think this is a good case for a rank newcomer to come and try uh, even if you are looking for pyeloplasty to that extent i even find some of this pyeloplasties or pujos 
if it is infected, Gopal, this question is to you. An infected PUGO, would you rather put a PCN or would you put a EJ stent in those patients? Well, if it is infected um, and if the patient is very sick, I would rather put in a PCN. And yeah. putting in a PCN will not hamper or will not interfere with the PUJ. Uh, sometimes yeah. we all know that when you put in a stent, the PUJ becomes very edematous later on when you go in. Yes. So putting a PCN probably keeps the PUJ more virgin and helps you at the time of the surgery. So by the same logic, if you do this, this PUJ is not going to be something that you encounter in a hyaloplasty. This should be yes. dematous. There is a lot of adhesions. So probably this is not the best case scenario to do a uh, yes, right. in, in your right. learning yes. in your learning yes. curve, have you yes. attempted these curses? Yes, this this case is a typical case. Uh, you see, there's a large external pelvis, but yes. the issue will be the pelvis will be thickened and edematous. Second issue is after taking out the stone, creating neo UPJ will be difficult, and uh, most important issue is peri pelvic dissection. And uh, anastomosis may not be that much good because for initial phase or uh, for a newcomer to venture this type of case, I don't feel it is good. Probably uh, should not take. Okay. So this probably is, is a little uh, doing a, a pilot lithotomy, although it looks very lucrative and looks rather easy, is something that you should take with some degree of trepidation. Uh, yes, there are certain advantages in that you are not dissecting near the pedicle and the stone probably will be presenting itself if you have gone through those planes. So be careful, do not injure the ureter, do not uh, sort of tear the ureter or the renal pelvis when attempting such, such surgeries. Now this one, obviously this, this is a, just a video of a uh, surgeon doing doing a radical nephrectomy. So, what is what are the key points when you are going at the pedicle? Uh, Samir, would you like to take this? Once you have dissected the pedicle and you have the artery and vein in front of you, so what are your uh, what are, what are, what is it that you will tell your resident? Uh, well, do these take care of these things before you sort of move away to the next theater. Uh, hello, I, I, as yes. a, my probably voice was not clear. I am not. Yes, so Please this is a case. What you want to do. So this is a radical nephrectomy, as you can see. Okay. So once okay. the pedicle has been has been dissected nicely by the resident, you can see that he has dissected it nicely, and he is about okay. to clip the renal artery and the vein. So are there any specific things that you will tell him uh, before you say move to the next theater to assist somewhere else? or you move to the OPD? Uh, no, I think uh, uh, after uh, completing the hyalur dissection and uh, taking out the vessels, uh, dissection through upper upper pole particularly, near the upper pole there may be chances of getting another vessels, maybe some splenorenal uh, vessels may be a, a point for preventing the hemorrhage. So these are the two points I must tell. Uh, I are? think Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Samir. Uh, Samir, anything else? Yeah. Please no, no nothing. I, I think the upper polar dissection or, or uh, separation from the upper pole and posterior aspect is important after getting into the high lump. Because that point has to be tackled in proper way. Otherwise, chances of bleeding is quite high. Yes, yes, Prashant. What would you yeah. tell your... Uh, uh, if a resident shows that at this point he is going to clamp, I would not be happy. I would want him to clear more. See, my my hectum is you should have a window above, you should have a window below. You should clear all the posterior adhesions, whatever is behind the vein and the artery, whatever is there, you have to clear everything. So then you have the standalone, you have seen the arteries, you, you have seen the vein. That's an ideal case. Ideal case scenario where you're seeing artery, where you are seeing nothing else there, you are seeing the source muscle also, and then you start clamping. Put a clamp on the artery, look that the veins are totally collapsed. If not, look for an additional artery. And then you clamp the vein, 
and do double clamping and triple clamping whatever you want to do and after that start cutting following the principles of how you cut after applying hemolock so where there has to be gap this yes. thing so yeah. so so before you apply the clips uh, as you both agree make sure that the, there is no tissue behind it and then you so you are able to slide your hemolock you try to make sure that you can see the the end of the hemolock locking in and it goes beyond the structure and once you have clamped the artery do not be in a rush to clamp the renal vein you wait for some time for the vein to decompress and the other thing that i do that when i uh, before i clamp the vein i compress the vein for a while to see if it fills up or if there is any back bleeding and the last thing is that when i clamp the renal vein i clamp towards the specimen first and then i put the uh, i i clip i put the first clip towards the specimen and then the other clips towards the patient so this prevents further engorgement of the renal vein yes clear sir so we need to wind up copal yes sir okay <clears throat> so open surgery experience before lap surgery is it mandatory or essential samir three more yes sir and this is something uh, that has fascinated me always Uh, as urologists, we all have fantastic endourology skills. Does it translate into quicker laparoscopic skills? This is something that general surgeons do not have. So we have this I, innate advantage. Yes. Yes, the hand-eye coordination is built in. You know that. You, yeah. So I think it helps. If you are a good endoscopic yes. endourologist, you will probably pick up lab much easier. Yes. Much easier. So the message to all of us is that. please do laparoscopic urology you will find that your learning curve is actually much faster than uh, the uh, otherwise a general surgeon so then we'll probably f- uh, wind up quickly um, so how do you train to become f- uh, to become faster do you use endo trainers what is the role of endo trainers do you all have endo trainers in your in your uh, sort of surgeon's room or in your house uh, and how frequently do you do the endo trainer so I don't have an endotainer with me. You know, I feel endotainer personally. It is good for the initial hand-eye coordination when you are getting your hang around the instruments and everything. Initial suturing skills, yes, it's must. So you can get your uh, initial skills. But once you have gained a fair amount of confidence on an endotainer, you need to translate them into a real patient because the real environment is again much different from what you encounter in an endotainer. And exactly. I think then. Yes. Yeah. So, so therefore, endo trainers are useful up to a point, uh, not beyond that. Samir, anything? Yes, I, I think that's correct. Endo trainer should be for initial part. Doing it fast, endo trainer has got nothing to do because fastness of surgery, doing advanced laparoscopy, I, I don't think endo trainer has any role. Yes. So in it fact, is useful I in the. I tell my residents, go slow to go fast. So yes, I think I, I think all of us understand that, yeah. So yes, that's the key point. So I think we will come to the concluding uh, part of this discussion. There are few take-home messages from all of us. Is that uh, be a first assistant to a good laparoscopic urologist so that you you can see firsthand what he does and how he overcomes problems and how he gets through gets through various situations. Uh, the other thing is practice working with your left hand because you need to be ambidextrous to be able to use both your hands for suturing and for dissection third thing is work in pairs that is uh, have another friend who is also a laparoscopic uh, urologist with you or you have a surgeon who is with you uh, a laparoscopic surgeon who can show the camera properly and so that both of you learn at the same time um travel and this is something that both of our other panelists said that travel and learn from other laparoscopics do not feel hesitant to ask for uh, learning experience or ask for ask for some observership uh, program and the usi has many uh, observership programs uh, on board both in india and and abroad prioritize laparoscopic surgery that is give adequate time do not be in a rush this is what dr samir told at the beginning that do not keep this uh, laparoscopic case at the, along with a long list keep enough time so that you are relaxed and everybody around you is relaxed and lastly practice suturing daily especially during the initial learning curve so that you know how to hold a needle you know how to t- hold the thread you know how to take a reverse suture so that when the time comes you are not uh, wasting time so and lastly 
do not be afraid to place a laparoscope at least you can progress until you can progress no further and you can convert but do not convert from the beginning so do not be afraid of failure please go ahead and do as much as you can thank you very much and i thank dr arun chavla on behalf of uh, dr samir swain and prashant naik uh, dr chavla many many thanks for this opportunity and i hope all our residents and young urologists have learned something from this we would welcome any questions if there are any Uh, thank you, Gopal. And I think uh, seeing the chat box, which is all empty, uh, yes. that is testimony that how nicely you people have covered the topic. You have made it uh, quite interesting. I think to begin with, the 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 talk was very informative. How Smir covered uh, the basic what you should armamentarium you should have uh, and what principles uh, of these uh, extra gadgets other than the routine laparoscopy instruments which we. Uh, put into the body the the optics uh, the camera system uh, the monitors uh, the energy devices i think uh, added uh, to that was uh, your presentation on clinical scenario uh, the last slide which take home message which you have given is i think the is the uh, i think the page again for the reason it's important to understand that uh, the laparoscopy is uh, Uh, it is not easy, but not difficult too. The only thing is, you should have uh, numbers. You should be watching more cases, and more important is, you should be watching from the master, which is very, very important, I think. And to watch the surgery from the master will make your learning very quick. So you, you, you need to uh, learn from the craftsman who has already uh, dexterity and who has already mastered the art. he will make your laparoscopy learn very quickly and much easy and you will be more confident once you have learned from this to to achieve this as uh, prashant and uh, gopal has told uh, you need to if you are if you are a, a high volume center is fine if you are a low volume center and you don't have variety it's better to uh, visit uh, spend some time learn start doing it and again revisit the same center or some other center you can make uh, you can you can make your mentor based on your procedures if you are doing a basic laparoscopy you want to do laparoscopy figure out who is the best in laparoscopy this person is the best in laparoscopy so this is the way you will you will pick up uh, the the finer skills and this will make your learning easy but again laparoscopy is going to stay uh, even if the robot comes in large number the the other patient also come into Uh, uh, this our practice and in the business, but the the the, the skills of laparoscopy will always remain with the surgeons, and that's how we are going to cover the wide variety of the surgery as compared to the robot, which will be at expensive, the first capacity, not a cost effective. You can't deliver in district hospital and below as compared to the laparoscopy surgery. With this, uh, on behalf of Indian School of Urology, many thanks to uh, Gopal. many thanks to prashant and many thanks to samir and uh, just for the sake of writing so we'll be having one session on the laparoscopic procedure during our uh, annual conference of uh, uh, urology society of india in gurgaon we have already prepared the script everything will be uh, there so once if you have registered please attend the session as well we'll be sending the document of that section too um with this thank you very much and uh, thanks uh, navneet and kiran for the basic support on behalf of uh, usa also from dr prashant muti many thanks to young faculty and uh, the residents and as well as prashant sumir and gopal to you also thank you very much good night thank you sir. thank you thank you very much sir thank, thank you, you.